Okay, so the plan for today is to continue with a bit more uh, of the simple details of the good candidates for inflation that we've been talking about. Um, I'll finish the story of the axions. Um, then I'll do, um, then I'll describe a completely different mechanism for inflation, um, which is one of the cases with a steep potential. Um, and then um, we'll start to wind down, make a few summary comments about the prospects for the observational tests of some of these things, um, though that's mainly being covered by, by others. So um, just to remind you where we got to at the end of last time, we were describing axions. And we started, as probably we should, from the bottom up, just thinking about uh, axions as they had been in field theory. So this idea of so-called natural inflation um, with a potential that is usually taken of this form. It's got the sinusoidal variation um, with some period f. Uh, again, slow roll requires f bigger than the Planck scale. And um, it's an interesting possibility, but it's worth asking from the top down, does that happen? And in the context of string theory, um, if we restrict to situations where the sizes are big and the coupling is weak, um, we found that F is, in fact, parametrically smaller than M Planck. Um, and that's where we were at the end of last time. Now I want to proceed with the uh, analysis of how axions work in string theory um, rather than just uh, stopping with this, um, with this uh, description. Um, and there are, there's a twist on the story, which is quite interesting. Um, actually, there are two reasons why this is uh, modified um, or could be modified, one of which you could also think about purely in, in field theory. Um, uh, which is, uh, goes under the name of inflation. Um, and another, the main twist on the story I'll get to uh, is called monodromy. So let me start with the first one. First one is a pretty simple idea. Uh, it is to consider multiple axions and see what that does. That might be motivated by, you know, a generosity idea that if there's one pseudoscalar, why couldn't there be many, especially in these complicated compactifications we find in string theory? Um, and well, what's the utility of that for the purpose of inflationary model building? Well, it's basically that the kinetic term um, that we've been focusing on, and remember, uh, there's kind of an ang a natural angular variable. We've been calling it a, a, or we could call it theta. So there's some axion not canonically normalized, which has period 2 pi. Um, and so its kinetic term is, is f squared times theta dot squared. And it's that f that appears, therefore, normalizing the cosine, the argument of the cosine. Um, and you know the whole question is, how big, how big is this f in Planck units? So if we just proliferate axions, um, what happens is that the, well, the kinetic term gets a factor of n. And hence, naively, f squared goes to n times f squared. So if we consider enough of these guys, why can't we make the field range uh, big enough, even if the field range for each individual axion is small? Um, well, the reason it's not a parametric effect um, uh, so this doesn't actually translate into a parametric effect for a pretty simple reason. Does anyone have an idea? Say again. Well, the potential um, could be, you know, it's some sinusoidal potential in each direction in field space. It doesn't have to be uh, literally symmetric. Uh, 
you can allow for that and it's, it's fine. Um, so the idea is for each of the individual axions, um, there's an F that's a bit sub um individually, but then the collective field that's, you know, uh, motion of multi many of them together has this enhancement of the kinetic term. That, yeah, that's not actually the, the subtlety. Okay, it's not, it's not something you necessarily would anticipate, but the, the point is that, and this is something to keep, keep in mind generally, actually, when you start proliferating species of particles, you have to worry about what other effects that they have, and um, one effect that, that you get is a, is a change in the Newton constant. Um, so I, you can write this equivalently as a change in M Planck squared, a change in the, um, the Newton constant, and um, this scales like n. So there's some diagram describing the kinetic term for gravitons, and if you have n species in the, of matter fields, you have to worry about the fact that those build up an induced correction to the Planck mass, which if you take n off to infinity, you know, dominates over the original Planck mass that you had started with. So the upshot of this is that F squared over the, the true M Planck is, you know, this thing, this, this factor we had found here. So uh, let me just remind you, we had some, for, for, for one of these axions coming from a P form potential field, the uh, amount by which it was sub-Planckian was one over the size to that power. So there's that factor, there's the, bare Planck mass, and then there's the n that we just were happy about, but then there's also this n here. So uh, this correction, you know, goes like, it has dimensions of, of, you know, mass squared, and it goes like n times some cutoff squared. The cutoff could be some alpha prime scale, some, you know, some relatively high energy scale uh, that cuts off this, this loop. We don't necessarily know what it is, but we should allow for it here. And, and that's why this is actually not a parametric uh, enhancement of the effective F. However, if the ratio of scales here are appropriate or fortuitous, then you know, this could buy us a, a numerical enhancement. And um, so, could, so it's not parametric, but it could be just you know, numerically Um, big enough uh, for such a such a model. Yeah. Uh, this is a calculable. I, I mean, UV sensitivity is calculated. <laughs> you mean in a it's a it's a UV it's a UV sensitive thing, and, and the paper on this subject, which is called inflation, um, d d you know, studied some examples to try and get a sense of what the scale might be. Um, so I know. Yeah, in a specific example, you might imagine that you could calculate it. It actually is kind of complicated for the same sorts of reasons. We had complications computing corrections to eta in the previous lecture. But it's, it, so it's that style of, of yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, in a given theory, you can calculate it. You can see what this MC is. It's, you know, you, you can check in principle. But it, it's, you know, in these compactifications, it is a complicated thing, so. Um. So this is a possibility that is well worth mentioning. Um, and, but now let me just come back to this fact that, um, that I've already actually mentioned, um, which is that even individual axions in string theory do not behave just like this with this cosine potential. Um, the shift symmetry is generically broken um, more strongly than that. Um, so, so let's just go back to a single axion in string theory. And let's discuss its, um, how the shift symmetry is broken. Um, so we'll actually we'll talk about this in two different ways, which happen to be dual in the sense of ADS CFT. Although you don't need to know any more than you've been told, or even that, to 
to understand this. The idea is this should be self-contained. Um, and at the end of it, we'll see, once again, why uh, axions, which you know, start life with quadratic potentials, so again, we can get an axion from an integral of some form field. Let's focus on these two form fields that, that I've mentioned. Um, and there are terms in the action. You know, the action is analytic. There are, there are contributions to the potential which, which break the shift, shift symmetry uh, in the presence of some flexes, uh, but which are quadratic. And we'll see that, first of all, that's true, so the shift symmetry is broken. And second of all, um, it's quite generic for the for uh, the kind of flattening effect that I mentioned earlier to happen, and so the potential doesn't end up even being uh, quadratic. Um, so let's go let's go slowly and develop this. So um, let me just tell you one more thing about the axions, which I hope should help. So yesterday uh, I introduced kind of the simplest version of an axion from higher dimensions by thinking about a vector potential field in five dimensions. So maybe it'll help to recall that. Um, so we had, we considered a Wilson line, which was this uh, e to the i times the integral of the vector potential over the, the internal circle. Um, let's call this x5, the fifth dimension. Um, and um, remember just from ordinary quantum mechanics that if you have a charged particle, uh, it gets a factor of this in its wave function um, if you know, um, that keeps a gauge invariant description is one way to see this. Um, so the, the wave function of a particle of charge Q um, is proportional to the Wilson line. Um, you know, if you've ever studied the aharnov bohm effect, you, you, you should be familiar with this. So I'm bringing this up because in string theory, this B2 field is the analog of this, this A mu field in particle dynamics. So in string theory, um, we have a, so here we have, in particle theory, we have world lines of charged particles along which uh, we have a Wilson line. Um, and in string theory, there's a similar Thing except the action for the string being two-dimensional, the potential field needs to be a two-form field instead of a, a one-form potential field. Instead of a vector field, it's, it's a, it's a two-by-two two matrix um, potential field, an anti-symmetric potential field. So the upshot of this is that the string action um, has, uh, actually, let me write it like this. It has two pieces. Um, actually, let me back up and write this clearly. So the string action, for similar reasons to what we just said about the particle, has a structure as follows. So we have a string moving in some directions that we parameterize by some coordinates xm. And we have a two-dimensional so-called world sheet that's the analog of the line that a particle goes along for a string. It's a extended. Um, and that's these alpha coordinates or these sigma alpha coordinates. So um, The action for a string has a piece that's related to the, the area of the string. So the action principle min minimizes the area. That's this metric coupling. But in addition, it has a coupling to this, this two-form potential field. And um, what I'm saying is just that this is the direct analog of this Wilson line coupling to a charged particle. Strings and string theory source are, are charged under a certain gauge field, which is one of these higher dimensional analogs of electromagnetism that I keep talking about. Um, and, and for a string, it's a, the potential field is two, a, a two-form field. 
So if you um, grant that, uh, we can see something quite interesting, which is that, well, this term is a, just a total derivative in the string action um, because this, this here is an epsilon symbol in two dimensions. And if, the, if this B field is constant, um, you know, like we're interested in for, for these axions, for these Wilson line-like degrees of freedom, uh, this term being totally anti-symmetric and everything is a total derivative. Okay, let, let me spell that out if it's not clear. So we have d alpha x m d beta x n b m n epsilon alpha beta. This is anti-symmetric in m and n and anti-symmetric in alpha and beta. So I claim that if I just uh, write it as a total derivative like that, I get the same answer. And the reason is um, that the, uh, the reason is this epsilon, that it's uh, anti-symmetric. So you, the, the, the mistake term is zero in this um, expression. So what that means is um, that classically, in the sense of the string world sheet theory, uh, things are independent of B unless there is a boundary. Um, so there is a shift symmetry which does underlie the, you know, the, these axions, but it's broken, it can be, which, which can only be broken by a boundary or or uh, higher, higher corrections, like these, these, um, these flux terms that I keep mentioning. So what I'm trying to get across here is that there is a generalization of the Wilson line degree of freedom that pertains to strings. Um, strings are charged under a potential field that is quite analogous to the electromagnetic potential field that electrons are charged under. Um, this field has an underlying shift symmetry, but one that can be broken by boundaries of the world sheet. And you know, also this whole analysis has been um, at the leading order. And so there's a possibility of higher order corrections affecting it. So boundaries come in um, when you consider brains. So you've hopefully seen these pictures of brains with strings stretched between them. And those brains are nothing but boundaries of the string. So the shift symmetry is broken in the presence of brains. And um, <coughs> with that, I can just tell you. See, I have to do this myself, because Matthias and David were able to lift these with their bare hands. <laughs> It's a good upper body workout. Um, so, okay, so uh, when we do consider these, these brains um, that occur naturally in the theory um, and which are sources of stress energy that generically are present and should be included, uh, the shift symmetry can be broken. And how is it broken? Well, mm -hmm. the action for a brain is something rather simple. It's the um, it's the so-called DBI action, um, which is written like this, um, where these indices alpha and beta are indices on the brain. So these are coordinates on the brain. And what this is is basically an action which is minimized at you know, minimal volume. If, if you ignore this B term for a second, this is just the area of the brain as it moves in space time. Um, but the combination G plus this potential field is what really occurs in, in string theory for reasons that I was describing up here in the in the context of the strings, where it's, again, just directly analogous to Wilson lines for particles. Um, so the action for a brain is 
um, you know, the, the, le the leading bit of it is, is this square root action with both the G and the B, G being the, the metric of space-time and B being this two-form potential field. Um, am I missing? Yeah, the, the, the determinant is over those. So thank you for that question because I meant to. So that my, the determinant is is taken over those. I could have written that as an epsilon if I wanted to, but. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. So, so if this is a p-brain, we have these coordinates c. Um, there's a tension. Um, for the kind of brain I'm talking about, that tension is. Um, determined by, it, it scales like one over the string coupling for what it's worth. Good, other questions? Um, okay, so this is the kind of action that we actually have for axions in the presence of brains, and it's one step now to get, to connect back to something that I, that I gave you a cartoon of the first day, uh, which is that Let's just consider this in the simplest possible situation. Um, well, we're already doing that, where the, the B field, okay, where, the, where the axion that we're interested in is coming from, from B. So, so there's some two cycle, some, some uh, two dimensional subspace of our compactification manifold uh, that we integrate uh, our potential over to get our, our axion, which again is a scalar field in four dimensions. Um, not yet canonically normalized, but there it is. And now if we simply work out this determinant in the two by two case, um, you basically have a two by two matrix that's um, something like, propor proportional to something like this. Um, if you, if you just do this in the two by two case, so we have an anti-symmetric two by two matrix, so there's a B and a minus B, and there's a metric, which is um, here. And uh, the upshot of this taking the determinant is that the action, um, this, this part of the action is, um, is going like in four dimensions. It's, it's, it goes like the square root of this size uh, squared, sorry, to the fourth plus, um, plus the axion squared. That's, you see that it, you get the, sorry, this is squared. Um, you get the, if you take the determinant, this is, this is what you get. Um, and, you know, this is nothing but that, the sort of Pythagorean <laughs> potential that we talked about earlier in the, in the cartoon of the wind-up toy. Um, but it's what, but what I'm just explaining now is that it is what comes about for axions in much more generic situations where there's some compactification with some uh, submanifolds containing these potential fields that can be turned on, um, which at some fiducial level have a shift symmetry uh, that then is broken by brains in general. And the form of the resulting action can be computed and, again, gives a very simple answer. Um, so there is actually one of these fancy string dualities that relates this to the wind-up toy picture I gave before, but um, I think this is sort of the primary way to think about it. Are there any questions? I know this is, may seem a bit technical, but I'm trying to at least give you the basic ideas. L is the size of the brain? Oh, sorry. L is the size of this two-dimensional submanifold that the axion is threading. So there's the, there's the compactification, there's, the, there's some you know, two-dimensional manifold inside it that B is, is um, living on. So um, this, this, this is analogous to the circle in the Wilson line case, um, and L is, is its size. Okay, um, so you know this 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 leads to the same sort of potential we, we described earlier. Um, it starts out quadratic, is perfectly analytic at the origin, and then it becomes linear. 
at this at this level, um, and because of the constraints that I was just describing, this is the leading effect that's breaking the shift symmetry. So it's one of these large field chaotic inflation type of examples, which is which is protected by a, an underlying shift symmetry, um, and uh, at least this way we don't land on m squared phi squared per se, but we land on something a bit flatter. And you know, in general, there can also be the kinds of instanton-induced corrections that one usually considers to generate the axion potential. So um, we, should, we should allow for that as well. Um, but the, the strength of this is quite model dependent. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so, well, that's, that's, yes, that's very important. So what's happened here is uh, that the, um, you know, the underlying period of the axion is beside the point because boundaries can break the shift symmetry and they do so. Here we see how they do so. And, um, what, what's, what's happened is, again, this picture that I drew the other day, although it's a cartoon, if you try and think about the geometry of compactifications, it's actually you know, a very simple and pretty much accurate description. So um, here again, um, we, just had, we had some circle, um, and we had two brains. If you move one of them relative to the other, that's a, just a periodic direction. Um, and in canonical terms, that period is less than Planck scale. That's what we learned in, in the discussion of the kinetic terms for these, for these axion fields. Um, so the, the, the period of the circle is, is sub-Planckian, but as soon as you, you know, consider this brain that's connecting them um, and wind it up, there, it doesn't stop. Um, the field range goes on building up more and more potential um, in a way that's given by, you know, this, this expression. And it's in, in this picture, it's really just the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> it's just, you have this transverse direction, um, which is the, um, the first term here. And uh, well, in this picture, that turns into an L squared. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, the energy is linear because it's just the tension times the length of this wrapped up brain. Um, why, why are two two circles? Uh, well, this is a beautiful thing. It's, 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 uh, it's called T-duality. Um, and I don't know if I can explain it in a, probably I should be able to, but I'm not sure I can explain it very quickly. Um, but. It's a, it's, a, it's a close relative of the statement that in string theory, if you take a circle <laughs> and um, you consider, okay, to consider a circle in string theory, as usual, you have quantized momentum modes on that circle, but you also have strings, so you have winding modes around that circle. So you have a spectrum of states that includes um, modes uh, that are momentum modes that go like n over the circle size, but also winding modes that go like some other in integer m times the circle size. And if you exchange r and one over r, really alpha prime over r, um, to keep the dimensions correct, and, and you exchange momentum and winding, you get exactly the same spectrum. And it turns out, not only do you get the same spectrum, you get all the same interactions. The whole theory is equivalent. Uh, if you consider that duality in um, the context we're talking about, it actually maps this to that locally. I'm, I'm afraid I shouldn't try to explain that in more detail here, but it's, it's one of these, you know, intricate details about string theory that make, make us, uh, you know, enthusiastic about the theory. It's one of these things that fits together uh, very nicely and, um, again, it's, it's just one of those things that makes, the, that, uh, makes, you know, the theory seem quite elegant despite the, the complications of the, the various solutions. So, any other questions? Yeah. 
Yes. Oh, well, so, okay, I should, this is also, I'm glad you asked again. Um, there's a distinction, so, okay, let me just go over the indices again because it's important to keep things straight. The M and N indices here are sp space-time indices, so the, the string is moving around in some space-time, in our case, some inflating space-time. Those M and N indices are the indices of, of, of that space-time, and this GMN is the ordinary space-time metric. There's also a two-dimensional um, set of coordinates that just uh, parameterize the world sheet itself. Um, that's what this alpha and beta are. Um, and so, so you know, th this, this potential field has indices in all the, all the, all the dimensions um, in the ordinary space-time. And the, the indices that matter for this discussion actually do both, are both spatial. So, yeah, it's an excellent question. I'm sorry that I hadn't made that clear. One of the first things, if you start learning string theories, you have to keep straight the world sheet and the target space. And it's, 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 uh, any, other, uh, any other questions? Okay. Um, so I want to I wanna actually, um, I want to, dwell on this example a bit more because it's instructive to see how it's actually an example of the, the flattening effect that I mentioned before. And that's not yet clear from what I've said. Um, but it, it involves, again, another of these dualities, the ADS-CFT duality. Uh, but but I'll, just, I'll just describe it in its own right. Um, and I want to do this partly because it hopefully will make it, it's another way to look at this and maybe may a you know, clearer way for some, for some of you, um, and also it's just a way to see how everything hangs together. Um, so let me just uh, set that up by by raising the question again. Um, so I want to see this this effect starting from the action that I had written down for you um, before with the various terms, um, including these terms that I keep describing. Um, uh, okay, so let me write this this way. Um, let's focus on the physics of this axion field that we're interested in. It has a kinetic term, so this is its field strength squared term. This is the anal analog of E squared plus B squared in electromagnetism. And then I'm telling you it also has these, these terms that um, couple it to other field strengths, fluxes of, of other potential fields. So um, this, this is dB. I'll keep that explicit. This F is D of something else. So D of some, uh, D of some other you know, form field AP. Um, OK. Now, um, the question that you might have from this structure is, well, this, again, this looks like a quadratic term. It's, it's, it's uh, going to, go, at this level, this is going to descend to a, an m squared phi squared sort of theory. And yet, over here, we found this, this other shape of the potential, this Pythagorean shape. Um, and what I'm going to show you is how the, the back reaction on other degrees of freedom, the fluxes, the metric, accomplish the, the flattening of the potential from the, the putative m squared phi squared behavior that it has you know, near the origin um, to something flatter. And we'll see that this result here is just one, in, one of many examples of that sort of effect, um, which, I, which I think is instructive and maybe a step toward making all this stuff more systematic. So it's also just a fun, fun exercise. Um, so in fact, let's actually, uh, to do this, I'm going to remind you of um, something that Juan said, where he described the, the classic example of the ADS-CFT correspondence by saying that if you took a stack of some n of the 
three brains that we have in string theory. Um, and you look near the stack of brains, you find a highly redshifted region, which has an anti desitter solution. Um, and that uh, solution can be viewed in two different ways. That's the duality. The three brains uh, have a Yang Mills theory living on them, which uh, characterizes the low energy physics of the brains, and you know that that's the essence of the duality. Now, the way that the solution works is uh, is as follows. Um, well, one has um, we're working in a supersymmetric string theory, so there are ten total d directions. Um, there's the three plus one of the brains. There's the radial direction of the warping of the ADS, and then there's a sphere. So um, the, the solution is actually ADS in five dimensions times a five-dimensional sphere. And in terms of the stabilization of the moduli, there's a curvature term, which is negative. Um, and then there's a flux term, which is one of these five-form fluxes that works against the contraction of the sphere. So the positive curvature drives the sphere to con con contract. The flux pushes out on that, and you get a solution, which is ADS. So we can actually write this down. Um, the five-dimensional potential energy that pertains to this is some factor coming from the Einstein frame conversion that we discussed earlier. We have curvature, which goes like 1 over r squared. And then we have flux that goes like n squared over the volume of the sphere squared. So, you know, f squared, uh, if you if you like, has uh, you know five inverse metric factors, which gives us one over the the radius to the tenth power um, times the the n squared. And as a result you can stabilize uh, using playing these two terms off of each other. And the result of that is that r to the eighth goes like g string squared n squared. So let me just take the square root of that. Um, and r, r to the fourth goes like g string n. Now I want to use one more, one more fact, which is that uh, again, the actual fluxes that appear in string theory, um, okay, let me actually do this slowly. Uh, I don't have a chance here. Okay, so, so the, actu uh, the actual fluxes that we have in string theory are not um, quite F5, but F5 plus B times F3. Um, and that matters in cases where the S5 is replaced by something else like S2 times S3. Most examples of ADS-CFT are based on you know, positively curved spaces that are not just a, a five sphere, but instead have a somewhat more interesting topology. Um, and in that situation, the axion can thread the S2 um, uh, with F3 flux on the three sphere. And in that context, one gets that R to the fourth goes like G string times, let's say, N tilde, which is G string times you know, F5 plus B times some N3. OK, um, N5. OK, what I was calling N before. And um, we're almost done, because what this is saying is that uh, if we think about the action, the term in the, in the action that goes like uh, like we were just 
describing the term that looks like it's a m squared phi squared term, the term that goes like f times b squared. Um, if we keep all the metric factors, um, it's going to go instead like, well, so the action which has this f squared b squared term um, has, in addition, metric factors. And so there's the volume of the four dimensions times the um, f squared, which we've just said is n tilde squared, divided by r to the 10th. Um, and we also have a factor of the volume of the internal dimensions, which are six, six dimensional. So we have r to the 6 times n tilde squared over r to the 10th, um, which is n tilde squared over r to the 4th. Uh, and now, if we use this relation, we can see that, in fact, this goes with a net um, single power of n tilde. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I Let's see. I, I may be missing some factors of g. No, no, and, and, and it, sorry, and it does go as it should, like 1 over g string. So the point of this is that you take a term that looks like, oh, I might give m squared phi squared. You include the back reaction of the axion field on the metric, which leads to a particular dependence of the sizes, the metric factors like this r on the axion, you plug that back in, and you get, instead of getting a quadratic potential, you get a linear potential. And this is all coming from a, the gravity solution that corresponds to these brains that we talk about. So um, now we've actually seen the same effect in three different dual frames, this wind-up toy thing, which I said is dual under this r to 1 over r thing to um, the brain action, depending on an axion in this way. And if we use ADS-CFT to analyze this just in purely in gravity, we get the same answer for, for an interesting reason having to do, again, with the back reaction of um, you know, heavy fields, uh, which relax a would-be would quadratic potential to something flatter, in this case, linear. Well, so here what's, what's happening is um, the brain solution is stabilized by whatever combination of this F5 and this combination BF3 that you have in the background. And um, so, yes, that's true. And sorry, what was the question? Well, it's generically the case that, uh, you know, the, well, generically there's back reaction. In, in special circumstances, you might indeed, okay, I see what you're getting at. You, you, you could have the, the, this R, say, stabilized very tightly by some other ingredients, and then B isn't affecting it much, and then it wouldn't be much, much flattened. That's certainly true. Um, but I think that's, that's, sort of, that's an extreme choice as opposed to a case where back reaction is, is included. Um, there's another, you know, that you kind of, if you start playing with this, you see, you see it in many, many ways. Um, I, I, I could give another example, which involves, um, well, yeah, there, there are a few cute examples of this that one can analyze. Maybe I'll do one more just for fun. Um, uh, and you'll see that, you know, it's, it's a similar conclusion for, for different reasons. Um, Let's see. Um, so let me just quickly do that. 
Okay, so um, yeah, just to just to drive home the point, let me let me do another example. Um, where again we, we ask the same question. So our action contains these terms. Let me consider two of these gauge fields, let's say B2 and C2, um, and take into account that we have terms like these kinds of mixing terms that I keep talking about. In this case, we'll say this C2 is the axion we're interested in. If we have flux in this, in this B2, in this, um, the, if we have a non-zero field strength for this B2, which we often use to stabilize the moduli, um, then we'll, okay, at this level, it looks like we're going to get a quadratic potential for C2. Uh, but what happens is, um, you know, if you start building up energy in C2, this term costs more and more to the extent that it becomes advantageous to, for this uh, field strength term to relax, to, to adjust itself, to move away from the support of this C field and, um, the, and you know, take on some of the energy instead in this term, um, removing it from this term where it's you know, growing larger and larger. Um, so uh, maybe, I won't, maybe I don't need to go through the specifics of this case, but it's a, it's a very easy exercise to you know, work this out um, and see how much this flux D of B2 wants to adjust itself, remove itself from the, from the support of C2 as C2 starts to grow. Um, and you know, the upshot of that is that instead of being a C squared, um, this ends up being a, a, a phi to the six fifths, <laughs> okay, at, at large, large field values. Um, if anybody wants, I, I could go through the details of that, but it's, um, I think, hope, hopefully conceptually clear what, what's being said. Um, so from this point of view, it seems that if we see, you know, if we see evidence, sharp evidence for m squared phi squared, as opposed to any of these other powers, it's, you know, it, it means a lot about what the impliton is not coupling to. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Um, so um, I'm, now I'll turn to, the, to this other class of examples that I want to cover briefly. Um, so if there are any further questions about, uh, about the Axion case, uh, let me know. Oh, this is called monodromy. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, so this is called monodromy. Uh, what's, you know, one way to describe it is you have this circle, which the axion field starts out living on. But when you add the brain, instead, the potential unwinds it like this, um, which you can just unpack into a, into a shape like we've been talking about. Um, it's called monodromy because, well, there's a, um, there's a more general um, mathematical process that can happen where you, uh, well, let's see, how can I say this? Um, if you take a gauge theory and you have a theta angle and you shift the theta angle, you can turn um, electric fields into dionic fields, fields with both electric and magnetic charge. And as you keep moving in the theta angle, you keep generating more and more of the dionic charge. Um, so this phenomenon is actually um, a very old one and, and a very pretty one in gauge theory. In fact, there's been a lot of work developing this in, in different directions, and one of them is to use, use the effect, actually, that I just described. So uh, anyway, this, this phenomenon where you move around some underlying circle and you're, you build up energy or charges is, is called monodromy. Um, you know, maybe, okay, maybe before moving on from this, I should list its predictions, so just to be specific. Uh, you know, you, you, this, this makes a definite prediction for the tensor to scalar ratio um, for this linear potential. Um, the, the tensor to scalar ratio ends up 0.07. The tilt 
I forget the number, but it's, so if you look at the different powers, so phi to the fourth, phi squared, there's some line in the, in the RNS plot that, um, that actually Matthias showed this morning. Um, and if you go down in powers, you go deeper, deeper in this way. Um, so this, this one sits somewhere here. Um, at the moment, these are just two sigma contours, I think. And so it's not yet statistically significant to distinguish the powers, but I gather that it will be, which is pretty exciting. So, um, so the model is, is completely falsifiable on the basis of the gravity wave signature, which should be, which has to be seen at this level. Um, hopefully, the, hopefully Planck will hone in on the tilt quite a bit better. Um, and then in a more model-dependent way, there is actually a, a host of very interesting potential signatures um, having to do with uh, the fact that the cosine term could well be generated by instanton effects that, that are you know, periodic. And that superimposes some oscillations on the potential, which can be looked for in the power spectrum and ultimately also in the non-Gaussian corrections. And people have, so we, we talked a little bit about this, and the pe people have developed this a lot further. And um, it's something that is, is quite interesting to look for. Um, it's, you know, it's another thing that we're, um, with sufficient motivation, then you know, the bottom-up procedure of trying to be systematic about signatures. Um, now, you know, th this this suggests being careful about including the possibility of of you know oscillations in the potential. So the slow roll parameters can vary locally a lot more than they can vary overall, and still preserve inflation and preserve the the known phenomenology. So one has to include that possibility. For example, in the effective theory that Paolo was, was discussing. Um, so the shift symmetry might really be best thought of as a, you know, a discrete shift symmetry. Um, and so um, you know, there, there are these two numbers that you predict definitely, and then in a more model-dependent way, there's a chance of a more of a smoking gun for, for this kind of scenario. So um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, there was an interesting paper about that by Trevetti and, and collaborators. Um, uh, what can I say about it? Um, yeah, let's see. Yeah, I, I, I have studied that, but I'm, I'm not really prepared to lecture on it. Um, but it, it, it's an interesting possibility. I mean, the problem with quintessence is there's nothing forcing us to it. I mean, in, in inflation, we need an exit. Um, we have evidence for the primordial phase of inflation, at least. You know, we have evidence for super horizon perturbations, and, and inflation's a beautiful way of getting that and solving certain problems. But we know that you need to exit, so you know that, you know, if it's described by some scalar field potential, um, I mean, you, you, need, you know it needs to exit, and so a natural way to do that is, is through a scalar field potential, which allows for you to evolve from one phase to, to the other. Um, in the case of the late time accelerated expansion, of course, we don't know all that much about it, but there's not the same requirement of exit. And so at the moment, it seems like the simplest way to fit the facts is through a, a hard cosmological constant. Um, but it was, it was, you know, it's a very interesting paper, and the idea of using axions as as a quintessence field is, is I think, a, an interesting one. But um, yeah. Yeah. So that's that. So that's what they did in this in this nice paper. It was possible. It fit. It was. It, you know. It. So so, the thing that's being used, by the way, that maybe I should emphasize this again. I mentioned it earlier. In all, in all these things, one, one wants a, a small scale in the problem. So the mu here is small because the Kobe normalization is you know, 10 to the minus 10. So even in inflation, you know, there's some smallish scale that you need. Um, I mean, gut scale inflation. And we use uh, this exponential warping to obtain that in a natural way. So you know, given the possibility of this exponential warping effect, uh, you can 
reduce the scale a lot further without tuning too much because you know it's an exponential effect. And so they, they showed that you could do that in these warped compactifications um, using you know using this as the as the field. Um, I think I'm not quite doing it justice because it's been a while since I studied that that paper, but it's it's certainly a, a good point. Any other any other questions about this? Okay, so you know it's a it's a it's a lesson in how what looks simplest from the bottom up might not look simplest from the top down, but there's something else sim equally simple <laughs> um, that we can then and the two can be distinguished. So let me let me finish by describing a kind of related pair of, of, of examples of uh, inflation on a steep potential that we, that we discussed early on as, as one of two qualitative ways to get Hubble to, to stay approximately constant. Um, so, So, um, whoops, this is the subject of DBI inflation or trapped inflation, um, which are kind of related to each other by changing a coupling. Um, so, this we actually already mentioned. So, th these again have to do with inflation on a steep potential, but with interactions. That are that naturally slow the field down. So um, the potential can be sleep, steep, but somehow interactions slow down the, the the motion. And the kind of interactions that we'll talk about are basically variants of a, in some cases, a supersymmetrization or just uh, you know couplings like like this with a. Infoton phi and some other fields chi, um, and you know we will keep open the possibility of many species species of fields chi. So in ADSCFT we work with large n gauge theories because well that gives us these interesting gravitational duals for for field theories, and um, let's let's keep uh, this this is a possibility we'll study things as a function of the coupling. Um, and again, as I mentioned before, the, there are sort of two effects that can happen as a result of these couplings that I want to focus on. So one effect that can happen is that the, um, you know, the chi's can renormalize The effective action for for phi and its derivatives um, through effects like well so chi's can run in loops. Um, uh, let me just focus on a diagram like this with say four phi's coming. Sorry, uh, I need to I need to keep my. Uh, bosons and fermions separate. So what I've written would generate, for example, a diagram like this with chi's running in the loop. And the point is that the mass of this chi field is phi. And hence, when we integrate out chi's, um, we have a propagator for chi, which is proportional to you know, 1 over momentum squared plus this mass squared, which goes like 1 over uh, phi squared itself, and so um, that can lead to renormalization effects in the effective action for phi, uh, in particular ones with the field itself appearing in the denominator. So um, an example of such terms is, well, you have the ordinary kinetic term. Um, and then you can generate corrections, which go like, 
for example, a series in uh, you know, higher powers of the derivatives, again, with a suppression by powers of the chi mass, which itself is phi. This lambda here is the coupling, which I didn't write, I've taken to one, times the number of these fields. So um, n of these chi fields can, can run in the loop if there are n of them. And so um, the effect is in increased when the coupling is large or, and the number is large. Okay, so that's one effect that can happen. Um, and another effect that can happen is that the chi's can, can be produced um, because their, their mass, which is proportional to phi, is a function of time. So um, if you have a time-dependent Hamiltonian for a quantum mechanical system, you know, even if you start in the ground state, you don't end up in the ground state, and that's the origin of particle production. So uh, if you have a time-dependent mass for a field, it's generic for it to get excited, to get actually produced, even if you start with no chi's. Um, if you go through a point where the chi's are light, they will generically be produced. Um, now, the figure of merit, so here we saw that the figure of merit for, for these first, these quantum corrections was, um, was this quantity, lambda phi dot squared over phi to the fourth. And again, the lambda comes because, um, you know, there are couplings, but then also because you have this number of, of uh, chi's that appear in the, in the, in the loop. Um, Whereas the figure of merit for production is just the time derivative of the mass divided by the mass squared. So um, if you think about it in, in ordinary quantum mechanics um, or just in you know, quantum fields and curved space, this is basically you know, omega dot over omega squared determines the level of non-adiabaticity in the system. Um, and, and what that, that is here is phi dot over phi squared with no lambda. Okay, so um, particle production happens at a significant level if this quantity is, is bigger than one, whereas these renormalization effects happen um, at a significant level if, you know, this lambda phi dot squared over phi to the fourth is bigger than one. So the upshot of this is that this effect dominates at weak coupling. And the first effect dominates at, at strong coupling. Uh, lambda much bigger than one. And it turns out that both effects are extremely efficient at slowing the field down. So um, both of them do the, do the job of slowing um, the, the motion of, of the field. Um, in the second case, that is because the production of chi's from the rolling of phi has to, locally, it, it's sub-Hubble physics, and it has to satis satisfy energy conservation. So as the the field um, tries to roll faster and faster down the steep potential. It produces more and more of these, these particles, these chi fields. Um, and, you know, the energy density contained in the, in the field, uh, once kinetic energy starts to dominate, um, is being dumped into energy density in the chi fields. And, um, you know, that removes kinetic energy from uh, the field and allows the potential energy to, to dominate. Um, and in any case, it slows, slows the field down because, uh, again, by energy conservation, once you start dumping energy into the, the chi fields, um, you know, it has to be made up for by losing kinetic energy in the field. Um, so uh, 
So particle production slows down the evolution of the field uh, by energy conservation. And um, of course, once the particles are produced, they start to dilute during inflation uh, by a factor of you know, 1 over A cubed. Uh, so, you know, one thing this can do is just temporarily slow the field down and then, you know, it keeps rolling. Um, but uh, in these situations that we get in, in string theory where things are um, approximately periodic, if you have a particle production event that happens, you know, at one point in this process, it automatically repeats <laughs> multiple times. And so, um, it's a, an interesting possibility that the uh, effect that I just discussed of the particle production dumping en kinetic energy out of the phi field and slowing it down um, can produce inflation. Um, and that's been worked out um, and is, is uh, called trapped inflation. Um, in the case of the large effect of uh, renormalizations, one example of that is, is the DBI action, which one can compute using um, these methods of ADS-EFT, where the quantum effects of a large n set of fields is equivalent to classical motion in some gravity background. And that's what leads to the action that I mentioned earlier. So I'll just write it down again. Um, Um, and um, again, this gets better for larger lambda here, where it dominates over particle production. And because of the square root form of the action, it's impossible for the field to, to roll faster than um, the speed of light. And so that also produces inflation even on a very steep potential. And um, in both of these cases, there's a huge non-Gaussian sign signal. Um, so basically because it's interactions that are causing inflation to work in the first place. And so it's not a shock that the perturbations are also much more nonlinear than normal. Um, so this is another class of scenarios that um, you know, should be kept in mind when we do things systematically. And fortunately, again, it's something that's testable to some extent. So um, Paolo has been discussing the, the FNL parameters, and you know, these make a large contribution to what he called the F equilateral kind of non-Gaussianity. So you know, if that's not seen, um, these are falsified, um, and if it is seen, there's a lot of detail that uh, we'll have access to in you know, trying to figure out how inflation worked. Um, so, well, I guess this is officially the end of the period. I could, I could go on about the you know, sort of table of signatures and what's falsified by what, but I think that's sort of clear from what we've said, and, and again, uh, other speakers will cover the observations. So, I think I should just stop here and ask for more questions.